I don't want to sound like a fanboy, as if I'm someone selling you something, but being a YouTuber and coming up from your screen, being excited about something and telling you it's good, I know it comes out as me just trying to get you to watch the show, and honestly, you should, because it's not only the best show on television, but it's a work of art. It's a goddamn masterpiece, and I'm willing to stake my reputation on that. If you're not watching Better Call Saul, you should start watching Breaking Bad. Uh, that is the, the, the first... Uh, type of show you should watch and then Better Call Saul is the prequel and you will thank me for it I guarantee to you like you watch one episode the first episode of Breaking Bad and you will be hooked It doesn't matter if it's not your genre. It doesn't matter if it's not the type of TV show you like to watch I guarantee to you you will enjoy watching it and I generally wonder like why this is why why exactly is a show about a lawyer so interesting and so captivating uh, and I think it's two reasons. Number one, you know, when, when they say everything is political and nowadays they keep trying to make TV shows in order to push a message, I think Better Call Saul does that and it does it right. It doesn't come off as preachy. And in this episode, the message that they were trying to push was this just tried and true crime doesn't pay narrative. And it's not done in your face, but it's, it's heavily implied. As you're watching the episode that is done by just just like these slight ambiances and and, and the, the way the characters interact with each other that makes you understand that even though that type of life being a gangbanger and making all of this money uh, might look really appealing the people that are trapped into this life are miserable and this leads me to the second thing which why this show is so captivating is how relatable the characters are. They not only act like human beings, unlike other TV shows where the characters act in very bizarre ways, but they also act in certain manners that it's like, yeah, that's just how my friend acts. Like, yeah, I've seen people act like that. So let me give you an example of what I talk about. In the opening scene, we see Mike, which uh, is depressed and he starts hitting the bottle because of his depression. He is depressed because he is trapped into this criminal life now, having uh, to, to work for Gustavo Fring. And he had to kill someone, an innocent person, that was a kind-hearted guy uh, by the name of Ziegler. And he had to kill him because otherwise, chances are Gus would have gone for him next. And this is one of the messages in the show that once you're in, you're in. And it doesn't matter what you want once you're into that criminal lifestyle. Yes, the money is going to be uh, coming in. Yes, you're going to be incredibly wealthy and better off than other people. But your destiny is no longer in your hands. You have to play the game. You have to do the things that other people set for you to do. And as Mike goes home, he is being attacked by a couple of thugs. And, and what I really loved about it I lived in a neighborhood, this is a hundred percent how thugs act when they try to mug someone. Like, to me, it was, you know, like flashbacks from my early age in Eastern Europe. Like, they were just sitting out there, you know, in, in, in their backyard talking about things. Uh, talking about women and, you know, oh, she's mighty fine, she's got a nice ass. And one of them goes like, oh, yo, yo, look, the grandpa is on the street, look at that guy. So they start hounding him like wolves first, you know, just trying to, to, to follow him and intimidate him with, uh, I guess, wolf whistles. And one of them goes like, hey, can, can I hold $20? Can you borrow me $20? It's like, it's the exact way they speak. Honestly, like, it, it's, it's this thing that transcends culture. It's, it's not only something that happens in America. It's not only something that happens in other countries. It happens here. I live through that. And as I'm watching it, I'm like... It's next to impossible that the show writers don't actually have someone that was a gang member or was involved in that type of lifestyle to know how to create this scene and make it so realistic. Because that's, that's why I love the show. You know, it's, it's not just some Hollywood people in their ivory towers trying to fantasize about how the world is. No, they actually describe how the world is. And I was just, you know, blown aback by that. And another thing... When I mentioned that crime doesn't pay, you get to see Ignacio in his own house. And even though he's got like two women, even though he's living in this enormous mansion, he's miserable. 
He's not happy. He is stressed out. He, he is worried that they're going to come after him and they're going to come after his father. He's, he's stuck between a hammer and anvil, uh, between working for two mobsters. And you, you can see without the show actually telling you, like, is this really worth it? Would you like to be in his position? That's the thing. That's that's what the show is trying to say. Like crime doesn't pay, and it's showing you this without actually telling you. It's just showing things. And then the characters that they're, they're so amazingly done. Like you, you get to see his father, Ignacio's father. And I honestly didn't think someone else can outdo Ignacio in in a scene, but his father definitely manages to do that. He he comes all humble in the house. And he acts like a human person. It's like, I, I, I'm thinking, like, how would my parents act if I were to buy a mansion out of the blue? And it's exactly like the guy acts. You know, he, he goes around and looks at the walls. You know, he, he slowly turns and is looking at the environment, trying to understand what's going on. And, and you can see he is a smart man. Like, even though he doesn't say anything, he realizes that there's no way his son would have money to buy something like that legitimately. So it's from his criminal enterprise. But because it's his son, he doesn't have the heart to go to the cops and tell him. And, and this is like the, the archetype of the guy that is 100% straight. And because he's not into the crime business, he's not as wealthy as Ignacio is. He works 12 hours a day in his car shop, but he's happy. And, and you could see that in the previous episode when he was at the table playing cards with the guys. He, he was legitimately happy. You, you, can, you know, the only, I guess, unhappiness in his life is the fact that his son decided to take a wrong turn. But unlike everyone else in the show, he is the only person that is l happier than the most. And the way he tries to set up a trap for Ignacio is also very interesting. Because the reason he came there... Because someone offered to buy his auto shop and the land um, on it and wanted to pay a bigger price than the auto shop is worth. So he figures out that his son <clears throat> probably used his drug money in order to try to pay off his dad so he runs away from town. And uh, it's really interesting because when, when he asks, like, what do you think? Should I take the deal? was basically the test to see if the money comes from Ignacio or not. Because if you'd have said, no, nah, dad, that's, that's your auto shop. You, you were there all your life. That's your legacy. But he doesn't say that, which means that chances are he's the one uh, that tries to pay for, um, for his father to leave town. And, you know, it's such a heartbreaking scene when he says, the only reason I worked 12 hours and, and, and the only reason I kept that auto shop was for you. And... Probably Ignacio realizes what a disappointment he is to his old dad that, you know, he, the, the auto shop is like meaningless for him at this point. It's like he, he's got like this whole mansion. Why would he work 12 hours a day? He he made all of this money illegally. Um, and, and it's just, you know, it's heartbreaking to see. It's real drama. That's what I want to say. It's, it's just like real people interacting. I mean, it's not something that only exists in the TV show. You can definitely see this happening in real life, especially if you live in a country where uh, corruption exists and there's, you know, th this type of uh, people making money really easily and, you know, their parents want to be straight. It's, it's, it's really difficult to watch that. Uh, and then uh, the, the rest of the show focuses on the differences between Saul and Kim. I like Kim a lot more than Skylar, and I think it's because Kim is um, a better character in a way. Like, she's not as unreasonable. She's a lot more well-defined. And she doesn't really want the money, okay? She, she doesn't want to make money. She wants to legitimately help people. Like, she is a kind person that's trapped in the system. And, and this is something that... Um, a lot of people come to realize that when you're in law school or when you're in med school or when you're, you know, a teenager, you want to change the world. Like, you, you notice there are things that are wrong with the world, but you think that once you're going to be there and once you get the job, you're going to change these things. And then you, you are hit with the cold heart reality that you can't change the world. Uh, there is no way one person can change the world. And all of this ideological bullshit flies out the window 
the moment you actually interact <clears throat> with the situation on the ground. So for her, she legitimately wants to help people. She wants these pro bono cases and try to get people uh, out of a prison, try to help the people who can't afford a lawyer. She's, she's legitimately a kind-hearted person. But as her boss puts it, it's Mesa Verde, like a bank, a soulless corporation, that at the end of the day is calling the shots. And it's the bank which pays the bills. So when the bank calls, she has to answer. Even though she set up an entire day uh, to help other people, the bank called and, and she has to go. She, she, can, can you imagine like being the type of guy that you're in trouble, okay? You're in trouble with the law and the lawyer makes a defense and in the day of trial, your lawyer can't be there because the bank called him. A, a multi-billion dollar corporation called, you don't have the money, you're not going to get the best defense. And it's, it's again, like it's drama. It's tragic. And you kind of understand why this has happened. You, you kind of get why the world is the way it is. It tries to explain the machinations of unfairness. Uh, it's not that the people at the top are assholes. Some people at the top want to be good people. But the system is, is trapping them and is, is trying to uh, push them. You know, towards the reality. It's like, well, without the bank, we can't pay the bills, so. And the bank tells her to go to this guy that's a stubborn old man who doesn't want to move his house because the bank wants to create a call center there. So the bank doesn't care about this individual that has been lived there for, has been living there for years. And they have the law on their side. The guy didn't think about the contract when he signed it 30 years ago saying that uh, at any point, his landowner can buy him out. Uh, the $5,000 that the landowner was initially going to offer him is, you know, almost nothing now because of inflation. And he makes Kim realize that she's the bad guy. He basically says that, yeah, you guys in your corporate suits, in your corporate cars, you come here and you're... You know, you're all the same. You you give a little bit to charity. You think you're doing the right thing. And I'm thinking, you know, like about the people that are on Twitter and they virtue signal every now and then. They, they you know, they point the finger at someone else that's worse than them. And that makes them feel good. That makes them go on with their life. It's like, yeah, that's that's what I did. That That's a good thing for them. They chuck it up and, and they consider themselves to be good people. Um, it was like that speech. And it's like, you know, it, it applies to just... Other areas of life, like I, I know so many people that are like that, you know, people that are complete assholes, people that only follow their monetary interests, and once in a while they give to charity. Once in a while they they do something that they consider it's for the community so that they can sleep at night. And it's just like, you know, like th these types of messages that are, are, are just hidden in the movie, that they're not outright being explained to you. That the At no point... <laughs> You know, like, if this was done by some people that are woke, let's say, most woke people are social justice activists, and social justice activists do not like when people assume. So they use the characters to outright tell you what's going on. They, they go out of their way to, be, to make sure that the message is loud and clear. And this is why a lot of movies that are woke aren't really good because it's it's a lot more interesting when, when it's just implied, when it's just like hidden there, you know, just bubbling under the surface, waiting for you to, to pick up on it. Um, so, seeing that that doesn't work, Kim tries to go and lie to the guy. But the guy is actually smarter. It, it doesn't work like that. It's, he's not going to fall for a con. And this makes her really upset uh, to the end of the movie. Now, Jimmy is the opposite. Jimmy wants that money, but at the same time, he also wants to uh, go straight because he probably realizes that his relationship with Kim is taking a little bit of a hit. <clears throat> so he's trying to at least play it straight for a while, but he gets trapped into uh, the whole deal with Ignacio, which just literally kidnaps him and takes him into a garage, not giving him any opportunity to refuse. And he meets Tuco's cousin. And here's like a big part that plays with the comedy in the show, which is very well done, you know, it's such a tragic situation, but you're laughing it off because the characters are so well made. And I, I guess, I guess Lalo is interested in Jimmy because the guy 
got two people that were almost killed by Tuco to walk away. And that showed to the guys that, yeah, you know, despite the fact that this doesn't seem like a wealthy person, he doesn't work at uh, a major corporation, he has a big mouth. And as a lawyer, that's a good thing. So they decide to hire him. Um, and maybe this is like the type of lawyer that people like Lalo needs. People like uh, Jimmy, which doesn't work for a big corporation. And he's poor, so he's hungry for money. And uh, he's also easily intimidated. He's not like Mike. You know, he's not like a person that can draw a line and say, no, I'm not going to do this. No, he, he's easy to intimidate. So, so he does it. And at first he tries to... I guess trick Lalo into saying that uh, <clears throat> his fees have gone up and asks for an unreasonable amount of money, hoping that they won't be able to pay him. But Lalo wants Saul as the new lawyer for the Salamanca, so he actually pays him $8,000, to which Jimmy didn't believe what he is getting. And it's implied that if he's going to work for them, more will follow. And this is the biggest issue of the show. Again, like, crime doesn't pay. I mean, it does pay financially. But you're constantly going to be worried about being caught. You're constantly going to be placed in situations where you can't say no. And we know what happens with Jimmy by the end of Breaking Bad. So, it's that, you know, powerful moral lesson of, you know, crime doesn't pay. I mean, yeah, sure, you, you can make a lot of money, you can buy a nice house, but you're going to be alone with no family, no one to look after you. Uh, everyone wants to disassociate from you. And it's that feeling of being trapped that we know Jimmy ends up with at the beginning of uh, each season in that, those black and white photos. So, uh, you know, he, he does what's required of him, which honestly is not even such a big thing compared to what Jimmy is going to do in the future. Um, and, uh, he does it well, and I, I love the, the ending as well, like, when, when he goes back, he says, <laughs> he says that, yeah, Crazy 8 is now a rat. <laughs> He's like, well, look at it this way, it's your rat. <laughs> and Lalo knew this, like, obviously Lalo knew that, uh, Crazy 8 is going to be a police informant, but, um, he, he wanted to see how Jimmy thinks, and... He realizes that this is exactly the type of person that he needs. Someone compassionate that will legitimately fight even if the guy is a criminal. You know, he doesn't want to see his client end up dead or see bad things happen to his client. So I think Jimmy is going to get more phone calls from Lalo in the future. Um, and also the, the thing with Gustav and Ignacio at the end where Ignacio goes and tells Gus everything. Um... <clears throat> In a way, it was expected that Gus won't react to the dead drops. Which, you, you gotta understand, like, from the point of Ignacio, how bad that must sound. Um, because it means that your boss, knowing that you're going to be caught by the cops and go to jail, chooses not to do anything. Now, this is Gus we're talking about, but, you know, wouldn't Lalo do the same? Like, if Lalo would have had an informant from Gus and he would know that Ignacio would get arrested the next day. Do you think Lalo would intervene? Yeah, that's that's the thing. The realization that you're just a pawn, that, that you're just like the little guy, is amazing. And, of course, you know, he explains to Gus, it's like, look, if, if you don't give the drop dead drops anymore, if you don't uh, provide them the next day, Lalo will know someone talked and... Chances are it was just Ignacio and Crazy 8 that knew about the plan. Two people that Lalo could just the next day take care of it, as they say. So I think this was the actual test for Ignacio. Like, this was definitely the test to see if Ignacio is trustworthy to get inside Lalo's circle. Um, and uh, I think he's going to pass. Uh, the last episode, you know, he was really entertained with all that stunt that Ignacio pulled up. It was like eating popcorn, watching him go on, on the uh, roofs of buildings. And he still didn't get his trust. And I think like this is the time where we see if uh, Lalo puts uh, Ignacio to the test or not. So uh, from, from Gas's point of view, he's a corporate man. Like for him, it's like, okay, what do I lose versus what do I gain? 
Uh, I can lose a few loyal employers that I'm still going to pay when they're in prison. I'm still going to pay off their families. But I get an inside man into the Salamancas and this gets me closer to getting rid of, um, of Lalo. You know, so now uh, you can look at Ignatia as being an investment. And if it doesn't pay off, I, I don't see uh, a bright future for Ignatia. Let me know what you think about this type of commentary. Again, I, I'm going to look at the views. I, I do have to do that. You know, if this doesn't get at least 2,000 views, I'm going to stop making these videos because um, I do love making them, but I also need to make sure that you guys love them as well because uh, otherwise I can review something else like an anime or something. So let me know what you think and I'll see you guys in the next video on my main channel.